Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's been a long day, hot day. So I don't want to keep you too terribly long tonight, and we're all tired, and I don't want to give you something out of the Word of God very quickly this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I would not that she should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Uh, We're going to go a little further than that this evening, but for time's sake we'll stop right there but I want to preach to you a message entitled for example for example let's have a word of prayer Heavenly Father God again we love you tonight thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house thank you for the ability to preach your word now as always Lord forgive me of my sin free myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit Give me just one more opportunity to preach, Lord. If, but for now, Lord, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Lord, may everything that's been said and that will be said and done tonight, may it be to your honor and your glory. We ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, you think, I, well, at least let me kind of back up and, and say this. I, I heard this story, and many of you have heard it as well. But the man goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, what's the problem? And he says, my arm hurts. And he says, what do you mean my arm hurts? He said, well, my arm hurts when I do this. And the doctor said, don't do that. Now, it sounds kind of silly, but, you know, if you're doing something that hurts you, it's probably not wise to keep doing that thing. And my point behind that is, is that we should learn from our mistakes. And we all make them. It's not that we don't make mistakes. It's not that we don't make mistakes. It's that we don't often learn from the mistakes that we've made. And as I've also heard heard it say that, you know, history repeats itself. But there is some history we ought not repeat. Uh, there are some things in our past we ought to learn from and take note of and not do those things. We should, uh, in one of my uh, devotions this week, uh, I read, I believe it was uh, Jotham, if if I'm correct, and I may be wrong on that, where it said that he walked in his father's ways, but he did not do the things in regard to the temple that his father had done. And, and it's Josiah. His father was Josiah. So he was godly in the sense of the things that his father had done, but you may remember historically Josiah went into the temple and burned incense. And that wasn't his job. And so what Scripture was saying is that he did everything his father did that was good, but he remembered what happened to his daddy when he overstepped his boundaries, and he said, I ain't doing that. I'm not going to do those things. And I, I pray and hope that my children will one day will look at me and say, uh, and I mean this sincerely, uh, Dad's faults are these. I don't want to be that way. You can nod. It's fine. I don't, want, I don't want you to get my bad faults. I want you to get my, not good faults. I want you to get my 
What is it? Good traits. Okay? Uh, I don't want you to take after my bad habits. I want you to take after my good habits. Uh, and I hope, I hope that that's something that we would all strive for. And I think my dad would say the same thing. He would say, son, don't take after my bad points. Take after my good points. Learn from your mistakes. And so in our passage, it's interesting that Paul is comparing the church at Corinth to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And he's saying, y'all are just like them. Uh, um, in regards to their actions and how they're responding. Now, the last two chapters, he's been talking about liberty and eating meat that's been offered up unto idols and this idea of doing things um, not beca because they may have liberty to do it and you may, it may be okay in your mind. It may not necessarily be sin, but sometimes just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And he's going to kind of take this thought a little further and he basically comes right out and says, you know, you need to learn from the example of, of your great, great, great grandfathers and so on. You need to learn from history. You need to pay attention and look at what they did wrong. And not only look at what they did wrong, look at the outcome. And... He rebukes them by saying, you're doing the exact same thing, and if you don't change your ways, your outcome is going to be just like theirs. And that's fair, right? So um, when we look at this passage of Scripture tonight, Paul starts out by saying in the first five verses, he basically tells the church at Corinth that everybody has an opportunity to reap the blessings of God. Nobody in here tonight is exempt from the blessings of God. Can I just say that? The Bible that you hold, every blessing that is in the Word of God in the Bible that you're holding in your lap Every one of those blessings is every bit as, as meant for you as it is for me. Okay? Small crowd tonight, but nod. Let me hear something clang. I need to get a, a, a tambourine or something. Wave a tambourine so I know you're awake out there or something. Okay? So the blessings of God are, are for all of us. Okay? So when, when God said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, uh, that he wasn't just talking about Job. You know, so I'll, I'm never going to leave you, Job, but George, pff, you're on your own, buddy. Okay? It's not how it works. All the promises of God are for everybody. Now, pulling back on that, does everybody accept and respond to the blessings of God? No. Does everybody uh, uh, take Scripture to heart? No. Does everybody, as a matter of fact, in youth class, we were talking about this last Wednesday night. We're, we're going through a little series about uh, a, a victorious walk with Christ. And, and in your walk, having fellowship, there's a difference between fellowship and a relationship. So we have a relationship with God. It never changes. I'm going to teach them what we taught you. This is really good. Okay. Your relationship with God never changes. In other words, Dad is my Father. It's never going to change. Even if I want to change it, it's never going to change. I was born to Don and Pat Smith. doesn't change. When you got saved, you became a child of God. Ain't ever going to change. My relationship is I am dad's son. He's my father. That's our relationship. Never changes. Come straight on. God says my relationship with you is solid. It's sound. It's firm. No one can pluck me out of your hand, out of my hand. Relationship. But fellowship. Now, my relationship with my dad never changes, but I can make him mad. 
I can fall out of graces with my Father. In other words, the fellowship can break down. Does that make sense? The relationship never changes, but the fellowship can waver. And my fellowship is only as good with my Father, now watch, as I make it. And His fellowship with me is only as good as He makes it. So our fellowship with our Heavenly Father is based upon and dependent upon what I do with what He's given me. Fair enough? So, but it's all there. In other words, uh, we have the whole Bible, and the whole Bible is for every one of us. It's not that, well, one person gets this portion, or I, uh, this portion's only, it's the only portion I want for me. And by the way, a lot of people treat it that way, but that's not the way it should be. It's the whole book, the whole Bible, God's whole war, word for me and for you. But what we do with it depends upon us. So, here in the first five verses, he's letting the church at Corinth know that the blessings of God are for everybody. And he's using the children of Israel in the wilderness as an example. He says, More of a brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Don't be ignorant tonight. Don't be ignorant when I say God's words for everybody. He says, How that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, they drank the same spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Let me stop right there. What he's saying is, everybody experienced the Red Sea. Everybody experienced the cloud cover. Everybody experienced drinking water from the rock. Everybody had quail. Everybody had manna. No shoes wore out on anybody's feet. That whole generation experienced the blessings of God. All of them. Nobody was left out. But we know what they did with it. Right? Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5, he says, But with many of them God was not well pleased. That's, to say the least, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Matter of fact, we're not going to take time to look in there, but a uh, little trivia here, ain't but two of them out of that generation made it into the promised land. Any of you Bible scholars want to guess? Joshua and Caleb. And God said, you guys are going to be on. Because you remember they, they sent the 12 spies in? They were the only two that came back and said, let's go get them, boys. And God said, because you had faith and you believe you're the only two going in of that generation. Every bit of that generation, dead bodies lay sprawled out throughout the wilderness. Now watch. Not, didn't have to be. Didn't have to be. Because they all, right, they all experienced the same blessing. They all saw the miracles and the plagues in Egypt. They all crossed over on dry ground. God's hand of provision was on all of them. And yet, wasn't but two of them believed it and followed through with it and carried it through and made it to the promised land of that generation. Yes, the next generations went into the promised land, understood. But of that generation, of Joshua and Caleb's generation, even Moses, remember that? God said, speak to the rock. Moses kicked it, beat it, smacked it. Right? Don't, don't die on me now. Y'all were doing real good for a while, okay? And he, he was told to speak it, but he didn't speak to it. He beat it. Moses had a temper. And God said, watch, 
God said, because you disobeyed. Remember that verse? He said, they all had access to the water from the rock. Even Moses mistreated it. And God said, because you don't believe Moses, I'm going to... He said, Moses, I'm going to let you see it. Took him up on the mountain and he could look over into it. Isn't that nice? God said, Moses, you're going to die. But don't worry. I'm your funeral director. I'm going to bury your body. But they all had access to it. They all had access to the provision and the blessings of God. But I want you to see this. Everyone had an opportunity to reap the blessings of God. And second, verse 5, only a few truly grasp hold of the blessings of God. And mainly in this case, only Joshua and Caleb really understood it. And third point tonight, with a lot of little sub-points, see we're flying through this. Third point tonight is everyone can learn from past mistakes. So if you're taking notes, number one, everyone has an opportunity to reap the blessings of God. Number two, only a few truly grasp hold of the blessings of God. Number three, Everyone can learn from past mistakes. Notice verse 6 through 11. We're going to hit these pretty quickly. Number one, first thing, remember he's, he's talking to the church at Corinth and he says, don't be like them. And the issue at hand was, so let's kind of back up, the issue at hand was eating of meat that was being offered up in a temple of idolatry or a paganistic temple. So historically speaking, yeah, uh, they would sell this meat, and it was good meat, and a lot of people, they just wanted meat, but the problem was they had to go down into that pagan temple to get it. They had to go into the pagan temple to get it. The sin was not necessarily eating the meat. They had liberty to eat the meat, but it was where they were going and what they had to go through to get to the meat created the temptation, and it created the hindrance. And they would come walking out of the temple, and people were looking at them going, oh, you're one of those pagan people. You're one of those idolatrous people. You're one of those people that worship uh, that idol. You're, you're one of those people. They didn't know they were just going in there to eat meat. I remember it's been years and years ago when I worked in Grand Prairie, there was a, a Mexican restaurant there, and it was right on my way home, and a lot of times, Charlotte would uh, would say, "Hey, go by. They had the best chips and salsa ever." Still not sure I've had this good a chip salt anywhere. I can't remember, but at the time, and you'd go in for like three. It was on like three bucks or something. Like that. They'd give you a bag like this. I mean, a bag like this of chips, and I mean a big old bucket of salsa. It's a big old styrofoam bucket for like three bucks, and I'd go in for and get like ten bucks worth. I'd get like three bags of salsa, I mean these chips and salsa. But I'd go in, and when you go in this Mexican restaurant, I'd sit there, and there's a bar. I'm there to get chips and salsa. But I'm standing there, and the bartender walks up and says, what can I get you to drink? And it hit me. Why would she come up and ask me what I want to drink? I'm standing by the bar. So there's an assumption that I'm standing by the bar that they want to give me a drink. I'm there to get chips and salsa. Completely innocent. But I learned the next time to go in, not to stand by the bar. Wake up now. Say amen right there. And this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying you have the liberty to go in and eat the meat, but the issue isn't the eating of the meat. The issue is what you got to do to get to the meat that could be a hindrance to those people around you. And now watch. In this passage of Scripture, he's going to take it one step further. And he's saying, don't be like the children of Israel. And we're going to fly through this really quickly tonight, and hopefully you'll get the point. First thing, and my first point under this, he said, everyone can learn from past mistakes. My first point, it always starts with eating meat. Not necessarily eating meat, but it always starts with, we think we have liberty to do something. Are you, are you with me? 
Now watch this, verse 6. He said, Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. So he's talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. And remember, they're walking along, and, and, they, and they, listen, same people experienced the same miraculous works of God. They witnessed the, the parting of the Red Sea. They witnessed the plagues. They witnessed water in the rock. They witnessed all this stuff. And they're walking along, and, and some guy looks at another guy and said, sure wish we had some of them Egyptian onions. I sure, sure wish. I mean, back in Egypt, we had some of them leeks. We had bean soup back in Egypt. They began to lust and long for the things of Egypt. All the while, they were experiencing the miracles and protection and sovereign hand of God. Uh-oh. Paul's looking at the church at Corinth and saying, is meat really that big of a deal? Because by this time in the passage, he's already told them, you shouldn't be going into the idol or into this, this, this idolatrous temple just for meat because if you're going into this idol to get meat, if you have such a passion for meat and it's going to cause people to or die and go to hell because of what you're doing to get to the meat, it's not worth it. And they're still doing it and doing it anyway. And Paul's saying, this is why I said they're ignoring what he's saying. He said, it starts with your flesh and your lust. They wanted meat. Ain't nothing wrong. Hey, I can't wait to go home and have some of that leftover meat we had today. That was good meat. That bacon stuff, bacon wrapped pork loin, hallelujah, that was good. Throw it in a tortilla with some cheddar cheese on it and nuke it up. It's good. Okay? They long for meat. They lusted. It always starts with meat. Now watch, that's where it starts. Second point, starts with eating meat or it starts with their lust. Second point, then they began to hang out with the idol worshipers. What? Watch, look at verse 7. Neither be ye what? Idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. Wait a minute. One minute, they're griping and moaning and groaning because they wish they had the same onions and beans that they had in Egypt. And the next minute, they're making a golden calf. When did that all start? They became idolaters. Here's what he's saying. He said, you keep going into that idolatrous temple, you keep going in there to get meat, and sooner or later, you're going to stop and check out what's going on. Oh, see, we don't, want, we don't want none of this. Paul's saying it starts with the lust of your eyes and the lust of your flesh, and before you know it, watch, before you know it, you're taking part in that thing that you said you were only... You, no, I'm just taking... It's just me. Well, wait a minute. I mean, you got to stop thinking. They're offering meat up to idols. Maybe they go in one day and they're waiting for somebody to offer up a piece of meat unto an idol. Wait, what are you doing over there? Are you, what, how, how does that work? How does that work? Oh, you do this? Oh, okay. See, this is called being at the wrong place at the wrong time started with eating meat. He said, don't be like the children of Israel. They started lusting after the things of Egypt. Then next thing you know, they were then committing idolatry. He said, don't be like them. Oh, but watch this. Second point. Look at verse 8. Uh-oh. Neither let us, what? Commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Now, if I remember right, 
that dancing around the cow, people started taking the clothes off. By the way, that kind of act in fornication and this stuff that we have in the world today, it, it's idolatrous and it's evil, and that's where it starts. No different scripture. He said, don't be like them, because in this day, remember, it's Rome, and part of the worship of this meat and offering up of this meat was fornication. So they're going in there to buy meat. Oh, come on, man. I'm Listen, I'm almost done. I'm fixing to fly through this. You can't walk down in that kind of environment to buy a piece of meat and not go, huh? And what Paul's saying is your liberty to buy meat's going to get you in trouble and get you doing things all because of the lust of your eyes, all because you want a T-bone steak. Children of Israel did the same thing. He said, don't be like them. And by the way, it cost them their lives. I'm going to hurry. Look at verse 9. We're almost done. He said, neither let us, what? Tempt Christ. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. I kind of looked that up, that, that idea of, of tempting Christ. All of a sudden, this um, if I could read it this way, it says, Again, their complaining hearts show them to be self-focused and more concerned with their own desires than God's glory. And it caused trouble the same way with the Corinthian church. So the idea here is, is that they became ungrateful for the things and the blessings that God had given them. And they began to tempt Christ, basically saying, Oh, God, what you're doing for us is not sufficient for our lives, so I'm going to continue down this road. Now stop and think about this. It started with eating meat. And then they hung around a while to see what was going on. Now they're partaking in that type of idolatrous actions and fornication. And now, now watch. Come on, stay with me. It's a temple. Now all of a sudden, they're not going, now watch. They're not going to the temple to get meat anymore. They're going to the temple to worship, a, worship a, an idolatrous God. And they have no use for God anymore. Hey, there's a lot of people weren't in church today. They were out on the lake. They decided to go out there to that idolatrous lake. I'm just kidding. Nothing wrong with the lake. But again, stop and think about it. Nothing wrong with the lake in and of itself until you start pushing God aside. That's actually a great example. They began to tempt God. Yeah, let's just see what you do, God, because I'm, I'm going to go over to this, this temple. Notice the last one. Then they came unto God's judgment. Look at verse 10 and 11. Now all these things happened unto them for what? In samples or examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse, didn't I? Verse 10, my fault. Verse 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were what? Destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them, for an example, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. I find it interesting. It started out started out with just, I, hey, it's my, I can get meat. Ain't nothing wrong with meat. And that's number one. Started with eating meat. Number two, then they began to hang out with idol, idol worshipers, hang out in the temple, checking out what's going on. Number three, then they began to take part in the actions of the temple to include fornication. Number four, then they became ungrateful for the things God had done for them. And number five, the end result was they came under God's judgment. And Paul looked at the church at Corinth and said, don't be like them. And basically what he's telling the church at Corinth, he says, hey, is meat really that big of a deal to you? 
Is meat really that big of a deal to you that you're willing to risk your testimony and risk the lives of others who need to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Is your lust for the things of this world really that important? Are your liberties really that important? Or are you willing to give something up? It's an interesting question. He said, don't be like them. He said, they let their liberties get away from them. And it ended up being their destruction. So I'm just telling you tonight, church, just like Paul told the church at Corinth, let's not get so caught up. Watch. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Ready? Ending, ending on this note. Let us not get so caught up in our lust for our own liberties that we miss out on the grace and goodness of God. That's good right there. Stand to your feet.